Stayallday.com. Now tuned in to the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative. That is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, especially yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into one bundle, one package, one mindset, one method, one philosophy, one book, one daily masterclass that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today, I'm gonna to offer you some solutions. Because sometimes, sometimes in life, you know, you gotta point out the bullshit, you gotta point out what the problems are, we gotta point out what's going on and what's going wrong, but we also, at the same time, we gotta point out how we can actually you know, fix things. Because we don't you don't want to just be the you don't want to just be the, the thermometer, you wanna be the thermostat, which I talked about in my book, Work on Your Game, which you can acquire by going to work on your game if you have not been to that website before. But the last couple of days on this show, we've talked about black self accountability. That is a solution. I told you well, I was asking the question what it means to be pro black according to some people and addressing that. And then yesterday we dissected this concept of critical race theory. Now today, we're gonna wrap up this little mini series here and I'm gonna give you four steps and that, what, that we will use to fix or help or support or whatever word you wanna use to repair, to restore, to improve, any one of those words, whichever one you think fits, maybe more than one, the black community in the United States of America and to do it right now. I'm not talking about next week. I'm not saying six months from now, it's not gonna take 150 years. Here's how we do it right now. Now, first of all, before I go any further into this, let me tell you that I've have, I have a text line. Since there are no comments you know, on uh, the audio apps, at least, if you're watching this on YouTube, there are comments there. And the YouTube video usually comes out weeks after the audio ones come out. So if you're watching this on YouTube, understand that the audios come out first, the actual release date, and the YouTube videos come out weeks later. So if you're watching this on YouTube, of course, you can leave a comment there. You probably don't even need me to tell you that. But if you're on the audio app, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, etc., since the comments are not usually the place people go there or there aren't comments, you can text me directly and communicate directly with me about how you feel about anything that I say here today, whether you agree or disagree or anywhere in between. My number is 305-384-6894. Again, 305-384-6894. And I want you to engage with me because listen, as much content as we have on this show right here, as much content as I put out, period, it's not because I'm just this genius that comes up with all these great ideas. I mean, I am a genius, but that's not the reason why I can put out this much content. It's because I engage with the people who watch or read or listen to my stuff. And sometimes something that you say to me will lead to more material. So I want you to tell me how you feel about what I'm saying, because that can help me. It helps me understand art right, is not just what I think that I mean, we're not just going to be going off what I think. I will also go off of what you think if you can offer me something that may be uh, future content worthy. And I've had plenty of people reach out to me over the years and say, Jerry, why don't you make a video about this or an episode about this? And sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. But you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So text me and tell me what you think about anything that I say here today, whether you're trying to give me a suggestion about content or not. Maybe you're just talking to me about what I said. That's fine too. Let me figure out how to, I can make it into content. It's not your job. That's my job. I'm the one on the mic after all. So all that being said, first of all, before we, before I go into more about why we're talking about this, let me refer you to some previous episodes of this very show where I have talked about how we can help the black community or just things around the whole, just the whole concept of the black community. I talked about in episode number 1634, I told you, and all of these are listed down below in the show notes, by the way. So if you uh, don't remember everything that I said, just check the show notes and all of these will be listed there. In episode 1634, excuse me. I told you my election 2020 plan for black America. We know we had Trump versus Biden, but I told you what black people really need to focus on was not either one of those individuals. I told you what it was in 1634. In 1624, I laid out the biggest challenges facing black America. And today we're gonna fix those biggest challenges facing black America. In episode 1618, 
I told you what black people could be doing with the social justice quote unquote movement. It's hard to call something a movement when there's no actual movement happening. It's just a bunch of noise and gesturing, but uh, that conversation was taking place there. Episode 1533, how a black American can strategically combat white privilege. In episode 1885, just two days ago, I told you we talked about the pro-blackness in episode 1886. We talked about the critical race theory in episode 1884. Three days ago, we talked about black self-accountability. Those ones you probably remember. So today, I just wanted to make sure that I'm on the record. Sometimes I do episodes of this show just to make sure that I am on the record saying the things that I'm saying. So if and when I end up saying them later, nobody can accuse me of, oh, you're only saying that in a moment or you're only saying it now. Like, no, motherfucker. I said this a long time ago. Go look up episode XYZ of my masterclass where it's just me talking and I said this a long time ago. So sometimes I'm saying these things just to give myself cover for the future. So sometimes I talk about these things just for selfish reasons, but at the same time, the show is called Work On Your Game. So I'm always gonna give you some game at the same time. Now, if you are listening to this show right now and you are not a black American, if you listen to this show right now, you don't even live in America. You should still listen because the things that I'm gonna talk about here today might already be going on in your community. And when you hear them, you'll say, oh, wow, that's interesting that Dre even needs to say that because you might see it as a given in the community in which you live. You may see it as a given amongst your people, whoever those people happen to be. And if you are a black American listening to this, I want you to listen with a critical ear. And again, I gave you my text number. If you had to challenge anything that I said, I gave you my text number. If you disagree with something that I said, I gave you my text number. And if you agree with anything that I said, you can, you, can give me the, you can give me the flowers as well, okay? So all that being said, let's just get right into it because most of what I need to say are somewhere within my points. So the topic, once again, four steps to fix the black community right now. Point number one, we're gonna round up all the race hustlers. I talked about the race hustlers in episode 1824. If you did not listen to that, I suggest you do. If you don't know what a race hustler is, Pause this episode now, or listen to 1824, and then come back and pick this one up where you left off. But we're going to round up all the race hustlers. We're going to round up all the people who are preaching anti-racism. We're going to round up all the people preaching white fragility. We're going to round up all of those race hustlers, many of them black, some of them white. All whoever is a race, whoever we can identify as a race hustler, we're going to round them all up, and we're going to bring them all to one place, and we're going to line them up, and we're going to shoot them. No, we're not going to shoot the race hustlers. We got to be nonviolent. No, we're not going to shoot the race hustlers. That was just a joke, maybe. So we're going to round up. Here's what we're really going to do with all the race hustlers once we round them all up. Right, we're going to round them up, and we're going to. I'm, I'll give the message. All right, we don't need to. I'll do this. I'm going to inform all the race hustlers that their services are no longer needed in the community. Now, while these folks, these race hustlers, I believe that every one of them has positive intentions. I believe that they believe their cause is just. I believe that their religion of race hustling, it is a religion, it is not based in logic, it is not based in reason, it is not based in uh, yeah, just logically thought out things because when you look at things logically and factually, a lot of things that race hustlers are saying don't quite make sense, but it's not about logic to them because if it was, then they wouldn't exist. All right? The religion of race hustling that they have bought into they believe that it is a just cause on their behalf. And there's nothing wrong with them having their perspective the same way, nothing wrong with me having my perspective. So I believe these folks have positive intentions. I don't think that they're trying to bring the community down on purpose, which will not be good. But we're gonna to get to those type of people in a moment. But we can, we gotta use the same measures that the race hustlers themselves use and judge their outcomes. See, we can't judge their intentions. We gotta judge their outcomes because this is what all the race hustlers say. They say any, any system or any organization or anything period that results in the outcome not being equal between blacks and let's say whites means that that system is inherently racist, thusly must be destroyed, torn down, abolished, you know, this, this member taken apart and rebuilt in a different way so that we can get equal outcomes. This is what the race hustlers say, again, Something that I say all the time here on this show, I make sure periodically I remind you of it. If I got any of the facts wrong, you can check me. Now, if you disagree with my opinion, you can share your opinion. But if I got a fact wrong, you check me. Now, if you haven't read the Race Hustlers books, if you haven't read their articles, watched their videos and seen their interviews, then go do that first to make sure that you're on the same page of what I'm saying here. Because I got this straight from the Race Hustlers, their own material, straight out of their mouths that if the outcomes are not the same, that means it's racist. That's what they said, even though, again, it doesn't make any sense. 
I mean, that would make like the NBA racist because 80% of the players are black. Even though the NBA player, 80 black players are a minority in America, how 80% of them become basketball players? That makes it racist according to the race hustlers measures. But again, that's not exactly the topic here today. So we got to judge the outcomes of what the race hustlers actions. What is it? What outcomes are their actions producing? Outcomes that they are producing. And here is an opinion. Black victimhood, the demonization of white people, and they're creating more of a divide between all people. All while, at the same time that they're creating all this divide, making black people feel like victims and making some scared white people feel afraid to be white. It's not all white people are buying into it, but there are a bunch who do. And some of them I know. They're, all, they're getting paid for doing this. The race hustlers. All right, they're making money in doing these things. Making someone feel like a victim is not uplifting them. So black people are feeling worse. Making someone feel um, incorrect just for being born and being a certain color isn't helping them. So white people are feeling worse. And then it's creating a divide between people. So it's just creating more conflict. So I don't think that's helping the, the general, just the general population. So I don't think any of these are positive outcomes that the race hustlers have produced, but the race hustlers are getting paid from producing these outcomes. And they will continue to do the things that produce these outcomes because it's going to continue to fill their, their pockets. So I don't think the race hustlers are doing a service to the community. Therefore, the first step in helping the black community is we got to get the race hustlers out of the community. We got to let them know that we no longer need their services and send them off wherever they got to go. Remember the, remember the story of the Pied Piper when he played the, played the flute and then the, all the kids just ran off with him and they never came back? All right, we need to get the Pied Piper for race hustlers and just get them out of here wherever they go. It don't matter as long as they don't come back. So that's the number one step. Again, see episode 1824 on race hustlers if you don't know what they are. Point number two. Today's topic, once again, four steps to fix the black community right now. Number two, we need more police. I'm letting that one sink in. The number two step to help fix, improve, uh, support, whatever words you want to use, the black community is that we need more police. Yes, you heard what I said. More police. See episode 1606. In episode 1606, I explained to you how to deal with police when you are black. In episode number 1820, I told you how we could reform the police in three simple steps. And in episode 1823, I told you the benefits of abolishing the police if we actually did it, even though that one was kind of a tongue in cheek episode. You need to listen to it yourself so you can understand my angle. I do not support the concept of abolishing the police. It makes no sense whatsoever, especially for a black person who's come from, if you came from anywhere within a big city in America, you know that abolishing the police is a really, really bad idea, unless you happen to be a career criminal. That's the only reason you would want to abolish the police. But otherwise, why would you want to abolish the police? Understand that there is no criminal in America, no criminal who has the, you no, know, they have control over their mental faculties, wakes up and plans to get caught committing a crime. Even though they may wake up and plan to commit a crime, they might know that they're going to beat somebody up or kill somebody or shoot somebody or sell some drugs that day or rob a bank that day. Maybe they planned the crime. No criminal plans to get caught. Are you following what I'm saying here? Even though the crime may be premeditated, getting caught is not premeditated. So here's a logical truth that I'm going to give you. And if you disagree with this logical truth, you let me know through your own logic why you disagree. OK, through your logic, the presence of police deters and reduces crime. Is anybody who disagrees with that? That the presence of police in a location deters crime and reduces the overall crime that takes place. At least the kind of you know, violent crime, the kind of crime we can see with our eyes. Not, I don't mean like you know, somebody committing fraud through computers and stuff like that. I'm talking about the violent crime, uh, somebody trespassing, graffiti, you know, broken window theory type of crime. That's the kind of crime that I'm talking about. Presence of police deters that crime. The funny thing is, ever since the summer of social justice was just a year ago, there are more articles that, depending on how you decide to splice the data, that will argue that the presence of police does not stop, reduce, or deter crime. It's funny. I looked this up 
and just thinking out this episode here, does the presence of police reduce or deter crime? And it was about 50-50. Half the article said, yes, presence of police will reduce crime. And then there were articles that said, well, studies show and experts say that having more police doesn't actually deter crime. And the reason why you can have these two different movies shown on the exact same screen and people come to completely different conclusions on the exact same question is because it depends on how you look at the data. You can look at data a million different ways. There's a book out there called How to Lie with Statistics. It doesn't necessarily mean people are lying. What it means is you can tell different stories with the same data depending on how you decide to look at the data. And really smart people know how to manipulate data to fool people who are not as smart as them into coming to the same conclusions at, to which they have come. And this is why one thing that I tell all of you all the time, you must get your own information these days. We can't depend on experts. You definitely can't depend on the news, quote unquote, because they can splice data any way to paint any picture that they want and they know exactly what they're doing. And another thing that I say all the time, these are not stupid people. These are very smart people who are hustling you because they are banking on your ignorance. They're banking on your laziness and your unwillingness to get your own information and guessing that you're going to just accept whatever they tell you because the narrative that they're giving you goes along with the narrative that's already in your mind. It's the Velcro mentality or the Velcro theory that if you already have something in your mind thinking one way, all I have to do is give you something that matches that and then just pile on and you're just going to keep believing it. And damn it, this works. All right, people have been doing this forever. This is not new. All that being said, make sure you're educating yourself. So back to what I'm saying here. I logically, this is my logical argument here. And if you disagree with this, I want you to give me a logical argument that goes against it. Not an article, not a link to something somebody else said, but something that you said through your own brain that the presence of police deters and reduces crime. If anyone disagrees with that, please text me and tell me how and why. But anyway, the presence of police will make crime be lesser. The presence of police means since less crime is happening and the criminals who persist in crime with more police around they will either be caught because they're doing a the crime and now the cops can catch them or those criminals will just find somewhere else to do their crime because they know they can't get away with it where they are again let me give you another logical argument that comes from my lived experience which is this when i go to a a really nice neighborhood whatever you consider to be a nice neighborhood in your mind and the, the lawns are all manicured. There's neighborhood watch. There are police riding around. There it appears to be very little crime going on. Maybe I just don't see the crime, but there appears to be very little crime going on. That's because the police are paying attention in that neighborhood. The people are paying attention in that neighborhood. They're you know, looking out for each other and the crime just isn't happening. When I go to a, a lesser neighborhood, the crime is occurring. The crime is happening in those places because Maybe the police aren't coming around as much. Maybe the neighbors, the people who live in that community, they have turned more of a blind eye to crime. They have kind of accepted that the crime is just going to happen and they're just looking out for themselves instead of looking out for each other. This is what happens in you know, not so nice neighborhoods versus what happens in nice neighborhoods. And I've lived in both. So the criminals, again, who persist, they'll just find somewhere else to do the crime. It's not like they're, not all criminals are going to just stop doing crime because they realize that there are police around. Let's just go somewhere else and do the exact same things. And the point that I'm making here is, this is the bigger point about having more police. When we have more cops, people will feel safer. Why? Because crime went down and criminals went away. Safer people and safer communities equals more affluence, more money, more resources pouring into the community. When there, there's more affluence, resources, and money pouring into a community, what that brings, or maybe what brought it, is a higher quality of people. And when you have a higher quality of people, what do you get? You get more human capital in that community. I just talked about the power of human capital. Let me grab that episode. That was episode number 1869. Human capital is, human capital generates money, resources, affluence, intelligence, and human capital multiplies itself because it can't do anything else. By the law of association, it will find other people who have also human capital and that human capital will multiply. So this is what happens when you bring, when you have less crime in the community, human capital eventually is going to go up. And understand that this human capital can come from within the community as well. It doesn't have to come from outside. It's not like you have to gentrify a neighborhood for the human capital of that neighborhood to go up. 
what needs to happen is you got to take the garbage out of the community, i.e. the criminals and the crime and the negative energy in the community. You got to get that out. And then the human capital that might already have been in the community will start to show itself because it will realize that there is a reward for putting your human capital out there in the neighborhood. So again, it doesn't necessarily have to be through gentrification for a neighborhood's human capital to go up, but that could be part of it. And it will be part of it on some level because here's another thing that happens when you reduce crime in a neighborhood, more businesses will invest money into that community knowing that there are quality people in the community who will spend money at that business, less crime to threaten the business, less crime to threaten the community, and just hire quality people to sell their products and services too. Maybe that that company wants to associate itself with. Any of you who's an entrepreneur who is listening to this, we all have this thing called our ideal client. We have this thing called our target customer, our target market. We don't want to sell our products to just anybody or just everybody, even if they're spending money. A dollar from a low human capital person is not the same as a dollar from a high human capital person. It is not. And any of you who's an entrepreneur or a salesperson, you understand this. You don't want money from every single person who might want to buy your product. You want to sell to a certain type of individual. Why? Because a certain type of individual may bring a headache to you, even though they gave you money. And another type of individual may bring no headache and actually make your job easier, giving you the exact same amount of money. Are there any entrepreneurs out there who disagree with that? If so, I gave you my text number. So whenever you hear a company or you hear rumors of a company saying something or doing something that shows that they don't want certain money from certain individuals, there's a reason for that. I'm not justifying it, but I'm telling you there's a reason for it because all entrepreneurs do this. Listen, I don't want everybody to buy certain products that I'm selling. I want to sell those products to a certain type of people because I understand through experience, through doing thousands of transactions over the years, what type of people are going to bring a headache with their money and what type of people will make my job easier with the same amount of money. So businesses look at this the exact same way because businesses are run by human beings. They want money from certain types of people. They want money from people with a certain level of human capital because they understand that that will multiply whatever type of people they attract. It will multiply and they'll get more of those people. They want high human capital people. So when a community reduces crime, the human capital goes up. Certain types of businesses will now want to invest in those communities because they know they'll be getting dollars from certain types of people. Yes, this happens. And you can call it discrimination if you want to. And that's fine. But understand, then all of us are all of us discriminate because all of us entrepreneurs, we want money from a certain type of person. We don't want money from everybody. So that makes everybody discriminatory if we're going to do it that way. All right. Just to be clear. And anybody want to question me on that? I gave you my text number. Since businesses invest in the community, knowing that there are more quality people to spend money there, less crime to threaten their business, guess what else happens? Property values in that community go up. So any of you who is deep into real estate and deep into you know, land ownership and home ownership, your property values go up when the crime goes down, when there are higher human capital people there, when more businesses are willing to invest in the community in which you own housing or which you own land. Again, if I got this wrong, you let me know. People within the community, now, people who are growing up in that community, people who are impressionable within the same community that we're talking about here with more cops, they will see less of the people who are bringing the community down, and instead they'll see more people who are bringing the community up. More entrepreneurship, more human capital, more high quality individuals, they will see those people now as their role models because the criminals are no longer running things. The criminals are no longer the, the oh, what's the word? no longer the, the, the role models in the community, for lack of a better term. Now, what happens? The neighborhood becomes more of a destination spot. Now, more human capital is attracted into that community. Why? Because human capital is already there. With all of association, you become, you attract more of who you already are. Now, of course, there are some challenges to everything that I said. It sounds like a perfect plan, right? One challenge being that very few people want to join the ranks of the police right now because the conflict between black people and police that has been inflamed by the race hustlers is being is being blown out of proportion, first of all, but it's been inflamed. And every time there's some type of interaction between a black person and a cop that is not um, what's the word that could po that could possibly be in any way. There's some kind of conflict in that interaction between the black person and the cop. 
the race hustlers will immediately, as soon as they get a hold of it, they'll jump on it and amplify it and make it sound as terrible as they possibly can to keep creating more of this divide. And there's a reason why they do that, because again, they get paid based off of this conflict. They get paid based off of, off of this divide, which is why step one was getting them out of the communities in the first place so that they can stop, they can stop indoctrinating people with an antagonistic attitude towards police. We need police in our communities. Those of you, I talked about this in a police episode, so I'm not gonna recap it 100%. You can go listen to those yourself because I've already gone on the record saying it. But in our communities, people who actually are law abiding citizens, we want as many police as possible around because there's actually a positive interaction, a positive relationship with police in the community when the police are a steady presence there you get to know the police the same way you get to know the local neighborhood grocer, the same way you get to know the local neighborhood sports coach, even if you don't have kids who play sports because they're around and they, the relationship is built. The only people who don't want cops around are criminals. Why? Because listen, I don't do any crime. I don't mind if there are cops on every corner in the neighborhood that I live in right now. I'm not going to have any negative interaction with the cop. I'll say hello to the cop. Hey, how you doing? I'll shake the cop's hand. I'm not worried about a cop being around because I'm not committing any crime. As a matter of fact, I want the cops to be around but just in case some other silly motherfucker wants to commit some crime. I know they're going to get caught and they're not going to create more of that in my community. I'm happy to see cops around. So anyone who's trying to tell you we need to get rid of cops, what are you doing? Why? Why do you want to get rid of cops? And here's my question to anyone who is saying, well, we need to abolish the police or we need to get rid of the police or no, we don't need police to help criminals. We need no mental health professionals or we need some kind of alternative way to deal with crime instead of police. Here's my question to you. If some crime does happen, let's say we got rid of all cops. Let's say there were no cops in a community. Somebody broke into your house and you're in the house but a, and a criminal breaks in a robber or whatever you call a person who breaks in the house, a burglar breaks into your house and you're in the house, you're looking face to face with the burglar. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What if you're outside holding your phone or you're outside, you know, counting some money, you just came from the ATM and a burglar walks up, snatches your money or punches you in the face, snatches your money and starts to run away with the money. What are you going to do? Now, mind you, there are no police. What are you going to do? Are you going to call a mental health professional? Are you going to offer them an alternative way to deal with their issues of being a criminal? What are you going to do? Are you physically or emotionally or spiritually capable and willing and or willing to defend yourself from a criminal? I mean, I am. Are you? If you own a gun, are you emotionally capable of using it? If you are physically, are you physically capable of chasing down somebody who stole something from you and is running away? Are you physically capable of defending your house and home if a burglar broke into your home right now while you're sitting in the house? Somebody breaks down your door because they want to take your, your flat screen TV. What are you going to do if there are no cops to call, but you want to abolish the cops? I'm going to let you sit with that question. Let's move on to point number three. But we're going to book more police in the community. So you shouldn't have to worry about that because if everybody follows my plan, when I'm king of the world, we will have more cops and you won't have to worry about answering that question, which most of you who are talking about abolishing the cops can't answer. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, is we're going to fix the black community or improve or help or support whatever words you want to use. The black community in four steps. Number three, we need more father figures in the community. Now, let me be clear what I mean when I say we need more father figures in the community. Now, let's remember that let's remember that Black Lives Matter, the three women who started Black Lives Matter, wanted to destroy the patriarchy. They did not want to support men at all. They just want to make women and children comfortable. This is in their about statement, their mission statement on their website before they scrubbed it and changed the website once they started to get too much negative attention for saying these things. They want to destroy the nuclear family, the Western prescribed nuclear family, I don't know, you know what direction they want to build the family, Eastern, Southern, Northern, I don't know. But they want to just destroy the Western prescribed nuclear family, which is mom, dad, kids. They don't want that anymore. They just want the woman and the children. All right. We need father figures. Now, why do we need father figures? Because the number one challenge in the black community, I talked about this, I believe that was episode 1624, is that we don't have two parent households anymore. We don't have two parents in the house. We have kids being raised by women, specifically men being raised by women who don't know how to deal with authority, don't know how to deal with male figures who have any authority, i.e. cops, i.e. teachers, i.e. bosses, i.e. other men. 
This is what leads to crime. This is what leads to uh, violence. This is what leads to black on black murder is men not knowing how to deal with other men who may be in a position of authority, or at least it's a big part of what leads to these things. We need more masculine figures in the community. It doesn't necessarily have to be the dad in the home of every young man. It can be a man in the community who is, for example, a religious figure, a sports coach, a neighbor, a business owner, professionals who interact with others in the community. We need masculine men in the community who act as role models to the young men who represent the next wave of the community. We talked about dealing with the, I told you about the emasculation of men that has happened in, in, the, in the, let's just say the United States, because I don't live anywhere else in the world. I've been other places, but this is where I live. I talked about that in episode 1841, and I talked about how we bring masculinity back in episode number 1863, just three weeks later, I talked about both of those. So 1841, 1863, make sure you check both of those episodes. We need to raise males, and I'm talking specifically about males here. We need to raise males who are not being influenced with so much effeminate energy, usually coming from women, and also not being raised with negative energy, negative images rather, of what a man is, such as criminals and drug addicts. We need masculine men who have their shit together, who are professionals, who are businessmen, who are respectful, who know how to deal with other men and can be influences on the next wave of men on how to be a fucking man. Again, this can be a religious figure from any religious denomination. It can be a sports coach. It can be a neighbor, just a, a man in the area, a business owner, a business professional, people who just interact within the community. All right, we need more of these type of men in the community giving back to the community, engaging with the young men so they can know what it looks like to be a fucking man. Not to be a feminine man, but a masculine man. And ladies who are listening to this right now, listen, ladies who are heterosexual who listen to this, meaning you are attracted to men. Do you want an effeminate man or do you want a masculine man? Now, I would think that you want a masculine man because you're feminine. You need that balance of a masculine man. All right, how are we going to get masculine men if they're only being raised by women? All right, you need men around to help the men be men. This is... This is the, I mean, I don't even need to explain that anymore. I don't think I do. But if I do, send me a text and I'll have a conversation with you. When kids, young males see garbage, they become garbage. When they see drug addicts, they become drug addicts. When they see criminals, they become criminals. When they see men who don't know how to show respect to other men, especially men who are in positions of authority uh, relative to them, they do the exact same thing. Why? Because that's all they saw. They become what they see. The law of association. When you show men, males, young males, prosperity, masculinity, and respect, they become prosperous, masculine, and respectful. I mean, again, this is the law of association in action. It's, it is really that simple. And the reason why we have been creating this uh, wave of, and we're seeing so many examples of even these men who are getting in situations with cops, they just don't know how to respect authority figures. They obviously don't have too much common sense or home training. They're making stupid decisions in situations in which it doesn't make any sense for them to make the stupid decision. Then something bad happens to them. And then we're protesting as if uh, what happened to them was wrong when, wait a minute, they did something stupid that led to the wrong thing that happened to them. I'm not saying what happened to them isn't necessarily wrong. Depends on it. It's case by case basis. But, yo, you did something fucking stupid that led to that. All right, we're not going to talk about that. We just want to ignore the stupid thing that this man did. All right, who, where was his home training? Where's his father at? Who taught this person? And this person can be 40, 50, 30 years old. Right? Clearly had no home training, clearly don't have much common sense. Who raised this person? Right? Nobody's asking that question except me. Let's move on to point number four. And today's topic is how we fix, help, support, improve the black community in four easy steps. Here's the fourth step. And this is the one that's gonna be maybe the most controversial of everything that I said here today. We need more whiteness in the black community. <laughs> yes, you heard me correctly. We need more whiteness, quote unquote. I'm saying that uh, kind of tongue in cheek. I'm putting um, quotation marks. More whiteness in the black community. Now, Dre, what the hell are you talking about? Some of you are listening to me. You said, Dre, I've been with you up until this point. What do you mean we need more whiteness in the black community? I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm talking about here and why I'm using air quotes when I say whiteness in the black community. The National Museum of African American History and Culture, all right, this is a, it, which is a subdivision of the Smithsonian, which might be the most popular and well-known museum in all of the United States, maybe the most popular museum, not in the world, let's just say the United States. 
Again, it's called the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, that's the reputable organization that said the following. I'm going to quote them. All right, quote, whiteness and white radicalized identity refer to the way that white people, their customs, culture and beliefs operate as the standard by which all other groups are compared. Whiteness is also at the core of understanding race in America. Whiteness and the normalization of white racial identity throughout America's history have created a culture where non-white persons are seen as inferior or abnormal. Close quote. Now, all that being said, maybe, maybe you don't think there's too much incendiary ideas coming from that quote, but I'm not done. They put out a chart. And I want you to Google this chart so you can see it for yourself. Again, it's called Aspects and Assumptions of Whiteness and White Culture in the United States. Let me tell you the name of the chart again, because I would like you to look at this while I'm going to read. I'm going to read from the chart so you know exactly what it says, but I want you to see it for yourself so that you can be as shocked by this chart as I am. And I'm looking at it right now. It's called Aspects and Assumptions of Whiteness and White Culture in the United States. Again, this was put out by the Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, I want you. I keep saying that because I really want you to understand the, the gravity of what I'm about to share with you. Here are some of the things. These are all everything that I'm about to read to you. Let me tell you one more time. These are all aspects of whiteness. So remember my point here. Point number four. We need more whiteness in the black community. Here are some aspects of whiteness laid out by the African American Museum. Rugged individualism, such as self-reliance, independence and autonomy are highly valued and rewarded. Individuals are assumed to be in control of their environment, i.e. you get what you deserve in life based on you know, your actions and decisions. How about family structure? This is whiteness as well. The nuclear family, a mother, a father and kids. How about Something like the husband being the breadwinner and the head of the household. That one, okay, that one, I'm fine with that. You don't always have to be that way. Sometimes the woman can make more money. I don't have a problem with that at all. Children should have their own rooms and be independent or at least learn to be independent. This is whiteness, everybody. I right, mind you, everything I'm reading to you is a trait of whiteness. Emphasis on a scientific method, meaning being objective a rational and linear thinker means that's emphasis on the scientific method, meaning you're being white. Cause and effect relationships, meaning you do something, there's a result. Quantitative emphasis. Another thing, when it comes to history, the primacy of Western and Judo Christian tradition is whiteness. Okay, I don't, I don't claim a religion, so I don't really have anything to offer on that. What about the Protestant work ethic? This is whiteness here. Check this out. Hard work is a key to success. That's a trait of whiteness, everybody. Work before play is a trait of whiteness. If you didn't meet your, this is a quote on it, by the way. If you didn't meet your goals, that means you didn't work hard enough. That's a trait of whiteness, meaning if you haven't achieved your outcomes, there's something that you need to do. I'm paraphrasing it and saying it in my way. That's a trait of whiteness, everybody. Now, I don't know what the, I don't know what the alternative to that is, but I'm just reading what the African American History Museum has said to us. Status, power, and authority. Wealth equals work. If you want to become wealthy, if you want to make money, if you want to gain assets, you probably need to put some, not work, worth. Wealth equals worth. Now, I've actually done episodes on the show where I said, you know, what you have is not necessarily a reflection of who you are as a person. So that one I understand. That's more like a, a mental health thing. I don't necessarily think that's a whiteness thing, but again, this is what the museum says. Respecting authority. I just talked about this and <laughs> you know, teaching men how to be men, respecting authority. All right. That's whiteness. All right. To respect authority, you're being white. Heavy value on ownership of goods, space and property. That's whiteness as well. Everybody future orientation. We're not done. Planning for the future is a trait of whiteness. Delayed gratification is a trait of whiteness. Making progress is a trait of whiteness. <laughs> Expecting tomorrow to be better. All right? Basically looking forward to the future is a trait of whiteness, folks. Oh, how about time? 
All right, any of you who's black know we have CPT. They call that colored people time. That means showing up late and then joking about it because we're black and that's just what black people do, we're late. Well, guess what? Following a time schedule is whiteness. Being on time is white and being late is black. This is the, hey, don't shoot the messenger. Time is viewed as a commodity, it's a resource. And like I told you, five forms of investment, time, money, attention, energy, focus. I guess I was being white by even telling you that. What else? Let me see here. I'm, I'm not going to read everything that's on this chart. I want you to see it for yourself. But I'm looking for the ones that are just most egregious, but I'm reading from every little category and seeing what they're saying here. Justice in the justice system. It is based on English common law. Now, why that is whiteness, I don't understand. Uh, what, what other law you want to base it on? I don't know. I mean, we speak English. Protecting your property and your entitlements. It doesn't say what entitlements means, but protecting your property, the justice system protects your property. And that's whiteness. And I'm just asking and telling you at the same time. And intent counts. What was your intention? Does that matter? I would think your intention matters, but I mean, again, according to the race hustles, your intention doesn't matter. Just the outcome that matters. But again, I'll let you, I'll let you think about this on your own. How about competition? Any of you athletes out there or any of you who just believe in competing in life, being number one, winning in life is whiteness. Winners and losers, the fact that we have the dichotomy of winning and losing is whiteness. Action orientation, being an action oriented person. I did a whole master class on having an action bias in life. That's whiteness. You're being white when you're orientated in action. When you think about being in control, that's whiteness. You must do something about a situation. Instead of feeling something or bitching or protesting, you doing something, that's whiteness. Being aggressive, being extroverted. Extroversion is whiteness. It, I'm, reading right off the, I'm reading right off the page, folks. Extroversion is whiteness. Decision-making is whiteness. Like, I, I, this is a surprise, as surprising to me as it is to you. Being a decision-maker makes you white. <laughs> Majority rules, and they have in parentheses here, when whites have power. I don't know exactly what that one means. So, again, they're not giving any context here. They're just saying this. Communication, everybody. The king's English rules. In other words, not using ebonics or slang, but speaking, quote-unquote, proper English. That's whiteness. Written tradition. I mean, I don't, does that mean being, knowing how to write and being good at writing? That's whiteness. Avoiding conflict and... No, liking intimacy. Intimacy is whiteness, folks. Not showing emotion is whiteness. I don't think that's whiteness. I would consider that more uh, on the far end of masculinity. But again, this is their chart, not mine. Not discussing your personal life is whiteness. In other words, keeping it business and keeping it professional. That's what I would say. That, that's white. Being polite. This is the last point in the chart. Be polite. That's all it says. So being polite is whiteness, everybody. So... Again, this chart is as, I hope this chart is as ridiculous to you as it is to me. Now, being that you're listening to my show, I would think that we have some things in common. But all that being said, this is my fourth point. We need more whiteness in our community. I think this would bring our community up. A lot of these traits would actually make our community better. But I want you to go read this chart for yourself so you can see it with your own eyes. So you understand these are the kind of things that the race hustlers have, have us saying now are our whiteness, i.e. negative, because we're making this dichotomy between black and white. These are, these are black traditions, these are white traditions, and these white things are, necess are, are wrong. They're basically putting this out this way. I mean, you may have read the books yourself. You heard me talk about it. I think we need more of these in our community. We need more whiteness in our community. If that's whiteness, we need more of it in our community. That's my assertion. How you feel, you can let me know. Well, let's recap today's class, which is four steps to fix, help, support, and improve solidify the black community right now. Again, see episode 1634, 1624, 1618, 1533, 1885, 1884, where I've talked about other ways that the black community can be helped, but I wanna make sure I'm on a record with all this stuff, just in case anybody asks. Point number one, round up all the race hustlers, and instead of shooting them, we're just gonna inform them that their services are no longer needing the community and banish them from the community because we gotta judge them by the outcomes of their work, which is black victimhood, the demonization of white people, and creating a divide between all people, all while they're getting paid to do it. See 1824, where I discussed the beautiful hustle that the race hustlers have created. Point number two, we need more police. Yes, more police. No criminal wakes up planning to get caught. 
And the logical truth is when you have more police presence that deters crime and it reduces crime and it moves the criminals out of the community, just go find new places to do their crime for those who just can't help themselves from being criminals. And those who have a choice, they just stop being criminals and do something else because they realize doing crime is going to get them caught. Because again, no criminal wants to get caught. They just want to do the crime and get away with it. But if they see more cops, which means more chance of them getting caught, they probably will just stop doing the crime. People will feel safer. Safer people means more affluence and money in the community, a higher quality of people, more human capital. This can come from within, by the way. More businesses will invest in the community, knowing that there are higher quality people to spend money because they have a target customer, just like all entrepreneurs do. Property value goes up. People within see less bringing down and more uplifting the community. Youth see more role models of positive people instead of negative people. They see more winners and fewer losers as role models. Thusly, they become winners and stop becoming losers. And because the race hustlers are no longer creating more of a divide in the minds of black people, the presence of the police actually makes the community much better. And the police and the community actually work better together because the race hustlers are not out there fanning the flames, writing books and getting paid for doing it. Point number three. More father figures in the community, meaning masculine men in the neighborhood who can act as role models to the young men who represent the next wave of the neighborhood. The masculine men outnumbering the losers, the drug addicts, the criminals, people who are bringing the community down. We need to raise males who are not being influenced with so much effeminate energy by the women. We love the women who create the men, but we need men to show men how to be men, not women showing men how to be feminine men. We don't need that. Whether it's a religious figure, a sports coach, a neighbor, a business owner, a professional, anybody in the community who is a masculine man who can show other men an example of masculinity, an example of being a man. We need that. When we see garbage, we become garbage. We see prosperity, we become prosperity. And point number four, we need more whiteness in our community. National Museum of African American History put out this bullshit chart saying these things are representative of whiteness, which makes no sense whatsoever. Again, we need more self-reliance, people who are focused on themselves. We need more nuclear families, father, mother, and kids. We need objectivity in our communities, people who know how to think objectively and look at things, people who understand that hard work matters, that you work before you play, business before pleasure. All right, I don't understand how this is, how is any of this whiteness? All right, what you do is who you are. People will remember you by the things that you do, not necessarily who you say you are outside of your work because we spend Half of our waking lives working, All right, planning for the future, delaying gratification, understanding that progress matters, looking forward to the future. It's being on time, viewing time as a commodity, viewing it as a most, the most important resource in your life. These are things that they're saying are whiteness. All right, makes no sense whatsoever. Competition, wanting to win. No one understanding that there are times in life where you may win and times that you may lose. Being action biased, knowing that you need to do something about situations, being aggressive, and going after what you want in life, being a decision maker, right? knowing how to write, knowing how to express yourself through the spoken word and also through the written word, being polite. These are things that they list as whiteness. OK, if this is whiteness. We need more whiteness in our community. So that is the fourth way of four that we will improve, help and save and support and whatever uh, be uh, advocates for the black community. If anybody has a challenge to any of these, you can let me know. And if you have better answers, you tell me my number is 305-384-6894. Work on your game. Dre all.